So, in certain cases, the mu, uh, it is denoted as mu psi comma phi, the least value is 1 and there are pairs like this. When phi is the discrete Fourier matrix and psi is the identity matrix, in that case one can show that mu is equal to 1. Again, I leave this as a little bit of an exercise, alright. We can clarify why it is so in a tutorial or in a homework, etc. Alright, so I would like you to think. So, this is one, you know, pair of phi and psi which is very good, alright. The smaller the mu, the better the system. And this notion of better will be made more precise in theorems that we will state in this class. Okay. So, as I said last time, the Dirac basis or the identity matrix, when psi is identity matrix, it is called Dirac basis. All right. And the, uh, 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 so Dirac sampling basis. All right. So, when phi is the sampling basis and psi is the Fourier basis or vice versa, psi could be the Fourier matrix of which you take only few rows. All right. So, that is also fine, alright. This is a very, very good pair, alright. Now, this is intimately tied to the following concept which you have studied earlier on in image or signal processing. If you have a spike signal, its Fourier transform is completely spread out. All the frequencies are non-zero, right. You have seen this. Likewise, if you have, so this is for a spike signal. Likewise, if you have a flat signal, DC. What is its Fourier transform? It is a spike in the frequency plane at the origin. So, this is intimately tied to that, okay. But still algebraically you should work it out. Uh, a very good piece of news, okay. Uh, sensing matrices whose entries are IID random draws from Gaussian or Bernoulli distributions. Bernoulli means plus 1 or minus 1, heads or tails, all right. Such sensing matrices are incoherent with any given orthonormal basis psi with overwhelming probability, extremely high probability. This has been proved, okay. We are not going to prove this result. We will just state it and move on with it for the time being, alright. This is a fact, alright. So, therefore, such, uh, you know, random matrices are of tremendous importance in compressed sensing. All right, when you do assignments, you will see uh, if phi is randomly generated, the reconstruction results are so nice. If phi is not randomly generated, then the reconstruction results are not quite as nice oftentimes. Okay, so you will see that. Okay, yeah, so in this I assumed that the rows of uh, phi matrix are unit normalized. If you see this, if you see this, okay, I assumed this. Uh, if that is not the case, you will just have to divide, it will have to compute a normalized dot product. It does not affect the confusion. No, it does not affect. Alright. So, uh, and since psi is orthonormal, automatically the ith column is uh, also unit norm. I mean, every column is unit norm. Otherwise, you would need to unit normalize this. Alright. So, you would need to compute a normalized dot product. A uh, Gaussian wave that is not correct. Yeah, so this is going to be 0 mean Gaussian, all right. And the variance is actually, uh, I have not stated here, it is going to be 1 over m, where m is the number of rows of the matrix, all right. But it is not a Gaussian wave, okay. Gaussian wave and Gaussian probability distribution, okay, are absolutely poles apart, all right. Uh, quite fascinatingly, I have seen certain students confusing between the two. Okay. Uh, so, then consider y equal to phi f, f is going to be replaced by psi theta, all right. And you know the dimensions are familiar to you. So, now how do you solve for theta? You solve problem P0, which is defined as follows. Minimize the L0 norm of theta such that y equal to phi psi theta, all right. What is the L0 norm? The L0 norm is the number of non-zero elements in the vector theta. Have we covered this last class? Okay, it sounded familiar. Anyways, 
all right now p0 is np hard all right the best known algorithm is necessarily exponential in complexity all right so you normally follow a softer version which is called basis pursuit which replaces the l0 norm by the l1 norm the l1 norm is the sum total of the absolute values in theta this basis pursuit problem is an instance of linear programming all right uh, linear programming is known to be efficiently solvable in polynomial time all right now why exactly it is linear programming i'm going to explain but not quite now okay we will just leave these small questions hanging out for the time being and fill those gaps in later all right so that i first give you a birds eye view an overview of the whole uh, paradigm of compressed sensing and of course there are many many details to fill in all right so another bit of good news code for solving problems like these is written in matlab okay and is available on this website the package is called l1 magic it's written by uh, candace romberg all right this is available off justin romberg's website okay this piece of code is freely downloadable online all right even though matlab is not uh, all right now so here is the very important uh, uh, thing that i want to state it turns out that the solution with bp is as good as the solution with p0 provided theta is sparse and phi obeys certain properties okay incoherence or there are also other notions all right this has been well proven all right this has been well proven it does not imply that p equal to np all right because this is applicable only for certain classes of theta necessarily sparse theta whereas the np hard problem is for general theta all right okay so before we move on into many more details there is a fundamental question that needs to be uh, asked as well as answered okay is p0 which we saw is it guaranteed to have a unique solution at all right this is an extremely important question did we uh, did we talk about this last class no all right so uh, is it guaranteed to have a unique solution all right what do you think the answer is <clears throat> yes i i want to solicit responses okay <clears throat> what do you think the answer to my question is is it a yes or is it a no no i want certain response you know all right so let us say i have the best possible sensing matrix whatever best possible means do you think this answer is yes or no it absolutely must have a unique solution all right if the solution is not unique you cannot obtain theta basically because i mean imagine you went for an mri scan and then the doctor said that you the your scan reports are either x or y or z where x could be cancer y could be not cancer okay you can't have this right so you absolutely need a unique solution and indeed the solution is unique i'm going to prove this okay simple proof so the answer is no then compressed sensing just stops we have to just stop this lecture and go watch a movie okay all right so the answer is yes we're going to prove how so consider the case that any two s columns of an m by n matrix a are linearly independent all right then it turns out as we're going to prove any s sparse signal f can be uniquely reconstructed from the measurements y equal to af we're going to see the proof on the next slide what do i mean by s sparse signal it's a signal with at the most s non zero elements all right and of course the matrix a also must obey this property any two s columns are linearly independent so here's the proof all right contradiction to the rescue all right any time you don't know how to proceed contradiction is a very nice way to to proceed suppose it's not unique so then there must be f and f prime which are two s sparse signals such that y equal to af equal to af prime right so in this case both f and f prime are putative solutions so when that happens i can say a times f minus f prime is zero 
the zero, the zero vector. So what does this mean? F minus F prime lies in the null space of A. Now, if F is S sparse and F prime is S sparse, then F minus F prime is 2 S sparse, right? It's 2 S sparse. Why 2 S sparse? Because in the worst case, F and F prime have totally disjoint support. What is support meaning? Support is the set of non-zero indices, non-zero value indices. So disjoint support, right? So then the number of non-zero indices will get doubled. So it's going to be 2 times S, right? So let T be the set of those 2 S non-zero elements. We will call it T, all right? So A into F minus F prime is AT F minus F prime T, which is 0. What is AT? It's a submatrix where I only consider those columns which corresponded to non-zero values, okay? And F minus F prime T is a sub vector where I chop off the zero guys, right? So that's still zero. So now what does this mean? AT F minus F prime T equal to zero means what? What can you say about the column vectors in AT? How many column vectors are these? 2s. And what can you say about them? Since there is a linear combination of these column vectors which is giving you a 0, so they are not linearly independent, right? So those two, there exist some 2s columns of A. You know, you don't really care which, some columns, some 2s columns, which are not linearly independent and hence we have arrived at a contradiction, all right? So this means that F is a unique solution in this case. Yeah. Uh, is this equivalent to saying that the matrix should have a rank 2s, rank greater than 2s? Uh, say that again. Is this is, equivalent, is this equivalent to, to saying that the rank should be greater than 2s? Yes. Yes. The same thing. Yes, the rank has to be at least 2s. Pardon me? If the rank is less than 2s, you cannot guarantee this. Okay. So the question is, you know, why this strange um, assumption? All right. See, basically what this assumption means is that no sparse signal should lie in the null space of A. All right. Why do I talk about null space? Let us go back a few slides. See, this is a, ordinarily speaking, this is a, a system of undetermined, underdetermined equations. And it is underdetermined because there is a non-zero vector lying in the null space of phi. Phi is same as A over here. Uh, so that phi f tilde is phi times f tilde plus v, which is, you know, where phi v is 0. We do not want to allow any sparse signal to lie in its null space. And remember, we are looking at sparse signals in compressed sensing because that is what natural images satisfy. Even natural speech signals also satisfy that, either exactly or with a very, very good degree of approximation, right? So that is what we are trying to discourage, all right? Does that answer the question, right? So his question is, why care for this very strange assumption which has been thrown onto us from out of the blue, all right? It is in order to discourage any sparse signal from lying inside that uh, null space. Yeah, any, it, it is, it is right, that is right, okay. Yeah, you cannot have any column, uh, a, a, any collection of uh, columns which, uh, uh, which have that, uh, which are linearly dependent, okay. So yeah, overall, the, in fact, it may even be for argument's sake a full rank matrix, okay. But, uh, you know, I, I cannot have any such uh, sub matrix, okay? All right. Now, are these conditions on A valid, all right? Are they realistic or are, are we asking for too much, all right? So the answer is the following, all right? Uh, they are not always valid, but there is a large class of matrices for which they are valid, all right? And we will see something called as the restricted isometry property, few slides down the line, all right? And we will also see that randomly generated matrices satisfy this property 
with overwhelming probability provided the number of rows of the matrix is sufficiently large how large is large it is order s log n where s is the sparsity we are looking at all right so that is sort of uh, a peek into the slides that are to come later all right so uh, this was about the solvability of bp uh, i put in the math here but i'm going to skip this proof for now and move on to the more intuitive part of the lecture yeah it can be cast as a linear program nevertheless okay i will explain all right it can definitely be cast right so rithwik's question is that it's a sum of absolute values and why do i call this a linear program all right so i will explain i'll i'll get to it all right now before we move on we should look at a little bit of history all right the first use of the l1 norm for signal reconstruction goes back to a phd thesis in 1965 the author of the phd thesis was logan and it was a thesis not in computer science or electrical engineering it was a thesis in geophysics okay so geophysics people knew the magic of l1 reconstruction uh empirically so long ago how long ago was 1965 no before any one any one of us was born okay that's what i think so very very long time ago it was known of course the theoretical proofs have come much later okay theoretical proofs came around early 2000s or late 90s in certain forms all right so there is something stunning about the l1 norm problem from the previous slide we will see soon okay uh, what, what what do i uh, what do i mean by previous slide is the bp problem minimize l1 norm of theta such that y equal to phi psi theta okay so now before we proceed there are many other ways uh, to you know so, so we switched from p0 to p1 okay so p1 was one way to do it there are also other ways to solve for theta all right p0 is np hard but you have approximation algorithm which you can employ all right and uh, we will see those in fact we are going to see algorithms for estimating theta after we finish the theory and see lots of examples all right so there are basically two classes of exam uh, of algorithms one is called the approximation algorithms that's a whole literature in itself and then there is basis pursuit all right so now with all this very very elaborate in introduction we will state the first theorem which was proved in this uh, set of uh, journal papers which appeared in the year 2006 all right so candes romberg tau on one hand and donohoe on the other okay so these appeared almost simultaneously so what's this theorem about consider a signal vector f having length n means n elements with a sparse representation in some orthonormal basis psi that is f equal to psi theta where the l0 norm of theta is much less than n suppose f is measured through the measurement matrix phi yielding a vector y of only m much less than n measurements right so we have y equal to phi f equal to phi psi theta now if m is greater than some quantity all right let's not bother what that quantity is if m is at least so much then the solution to the following problem is exact with probability 1 minus delta where obviously delta is small so what problem am i talking about minimize the l1 norm of theta such that y equal to phi psi theta all right and for your reference all the dimensions are nicely given out here so what am i saying if i solve this optimization problem with some method all right let's not bother about the algorithm some algorithm is there magical black box so i press a button i get an answer that answer is the solution to this problem and it is guaranteed to be equal to the original theta right i hope you realize that this is a profound result okay so i mean in many many algorithms in vision or image processing 
yes, those algorithms work, you get answers, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, okay, you, you see answers on your screen, but very rarely do you have performance bound or uniqueness guarantees or guarantees as to how close the answer is to the really the true solution, okay, here is a problem where you have those guarantees established with very, very high probability, all right. So the solution is guaranteed to be exact with a very high probability, all right. Now what is the condition? The number of measurements m must be greater than or equal to c times, c is a constant which is independent of m and n, all right. Uh, c times log n over delta, then L0 norm of theta, this is the original theta, mind you the original theta times mu square phi psi, all right. So m has to be greater than the product of two very, very important quantities. One is theta L0 norm, the other is mu square. What is that mu square? It is the coherence value, all right. So now we will comment on this theorem quite elaborately, all right. So this whole slide is the statement of one theorem. The proof of this theorem is not easy, okay. Later on we are going to see two more powerful theorems than theorem 1 whose proof is actually much easier, right. Life does not get any better. You have more powerful theorems with easier to understand proofs, okay. So let us comment. Look at the lower bound again, m greater than log n over delta theta L0 norm times mu square. What does this mean? Can you comment on this, just stare at this, what does it say, just it is a lower bound on M, just looking at the lower bound, your eyes should light up, okay, very good. Uh, so Yash is saying that even if I increased my N, my number of measurements required is scaling only logarithmically, very good, all right, that is well, that's one point. So that is good news, right, because even if larger signals, just a small number of measurements, the number of measurements do not blow off, all right. So Chinmay is saying m is, the lower bound on m is directly proportional to mu square, absolutely right. If your phi psi was such that mu square phi psi is small, the minimum number of measurements required to guarantee exact reconstruction is smaller. And what can be the least value over here? This mu square can be 1, never below 1. Right? So that is good news number 2, all right. Third, third, uh, if the L0 norm is, so it is a sparser signal, you can make do with fewer measurements and that makes intuitive sense, right. If a signal is incredibly sparse, you need fewer measurements, right. For example, if you are taking an image of the sky, right, and uh, you know, it is basically a flat image, you will see it is highly compressible. On the hand, you take images of uh, say carpet texture, right, those images are not very sparse in DCT. So JPEG will require more coefficients for storage. So same kind of thing is going on here. C is a constant, all right, C depends on the phi psi pair, but it is a constant, it does not depend on M or N or on any property of the signal and it is a small constant. Okay, so uh, Vinit's question is what about this probability 1 minus delta, what is this probability on in fact, okay. The probability is on your choice of phi, all right. So there are certain phi matrices, okay, they are very pathological for which uh, this will not work, okay, so it is a probability on that. There are also certain pathological signals for which it will not work. In the sense if, if I do run some kind of optimization algorithm and get a get an output which is not the correct output in the sense I can make out this is not the output I am expecting. Yeah. Uh, can I again run something and get a different output? All right. So uh, le let me assure you that the chance that uh, assuming that your signal was good, you know, uh, was sparse and things like that, the chance that you would not get a good reconstruction is extremely tiny, so tiny that it you, you can say it will almost never occur, all right. So there is of course a minuscule chance where it does not work, all right. 
but this delta is incredible. So look, look at this. Uh, you can set this delta, I mean, you know, log n over delta. Okay. So your delta could be said to be incredibly tiny. It causes only a logarithmic increase. You know, so this is going to be c log n minus c log delta times this thing. All right. And log delta is going to be negative. So minus log delta is positive. So there is a very, very tiny offset on, on the number of measurements that are extra that are required for this to fly. Okay. So there are pathological cases of sensing matrices and signal and pairs of those for which the theory does not fly. All right. They are documented. They are quite intricate. Okay. They are documented in this paper. All right. So sparser the signal, better. The greater the incoherence, better. All right. And when delta is smaller, it's after all only log of delta. All right. So these are the comments on this theorem. Now, there is more to say about this theorem. Okay. The algorithm to reconstruct f, and in fact this problem statement and the theorem as well. Okay makes no assumptions about the sparsity level of f in psi. Neither does it make any assumptions on which were the elements that are non-zero. Right? So you do not know what is the support of theta. I am not saying that you know index number 1 must be non-zero or index number 10 must be non-zero. I do not care. Alright? I do not care which is the support of the uh, of the vector theta, all right. I have not made that assumption. Okay. The only thing it is stating is, if theta is not sparse enough, better be prepared for a very large number of measurements. Okay. So, I mean, we can go to extreme cases. What if theta L zero norm is equal to n? It's not at all sparse. What does this mean? You will need at least n log n measurements if you execute this algorithm. Right, but if indeed, uh, uh, if you indeed have n log n uh, measurements, okay, do you really need n log n measurements? No, there's no noise over here so far. All right, so with just n measurements, you can then just do a matrix inversion. All right, so nobody wants to run this algorithm. Okay, so if if at all your signal is not at all sparse, then there's not much of hope in terms of saving the number of measurements. Also, the algorithm does not have any notion or consideration for uniformly spaced sampling, okay, unlike in Nyquist theorem, right, yeah. So, does this theorem say things about the basis pursuit problem or does it say that there is a unique solution? In it is the, the solution to this optimization algorithm, which is basically basis pursuit. Yeah, this is about this. All right. Uh, a solution for the theta L0 norm being unique has been established, all right. Uh, that is an uninteresting thing because it is going to be exponential in co time complexity. This is interesting because this is efficiently solvable, right. So this theorem talks about this particular problem. Even though we are penalizing the L1 norm and not the L0 norm, we are still getting a reconstruction that is accurate. Okay, it is sparse as possible, it is accurate. Basically, it is the same as the solution of your P0 problem, which would be very, very expensive to compute. All right. So, the L1 norm was known for a very long time. I told you about 1965. But the theoretical optimality, you know, proving something takes you into a different orbit. All right. This is not to say that experimental results are not exciting. Of course, they are exciting. All right. But when you can prove that they work, then you know when they do not work, what are the conditions required to make them work, all right. So this was done by Donohoe and Candace Rombach Town. There is also some literature in machine learning uh, or statistics uh, which proved something similar in the late 90s, all right. And we are going to touch upon it uh, in the lectures to come down the line, all right. So, I have said a lot about theorem 1, but I am not done yet, okay. Theorem 1 could as such be interpreted as a new kind of a sampling theorem, okay. If I set my signal basis psi to be the Fourier basis, alright. 
So, psi is now the discrete Fourier basis and the sampling basis phi that is incoherent with it is the standard spike or the Dirac basis, right. That is the signal is sparse in the Fourier domain and I am sampling in what? Sampling in what? Am I sampling in Fourier space or am I sampling in time, space or time, right. It is a checkpoint question. My signal is sparse in the Fourier basis. So, my signal is a sparse linear combination of complex sinusoids, all right. But my measurements are being made in which domain? Time domain, all right. So, it is like saying my signal is sparse in psi. And I am just taking a few time samples of that signal, right. So, f is sparse in Fourier basis. Then here is a, a corollary to the theorem in some sense, okay. Then given any not necessarily uniformly spaced m time domain samples, okay, the small typo, okay, n time domain samples. Sorry, m time m for mother time domain samples of f, where m is greater than or equal to c log n theta l zero norm mu square. This mu square drops off because it's going to be one, since it is phi psi combination is uh, time sampling and Fourier basis. So their incoherence is their coherence mu is one. So it's basically m greater than c log n by delta theta l zero norm. If this holds, then we get an exact reconstruction of f with high probability, right. So, I am just sort of restating the earlier theorem with few other constraints explicitly thrown in here. So, this is acting like a new sampling theorem that does not require uniformly spaced time samples or band limited signals. Okay, but there is a caveat. Right? What is the difference between this theorem and Shannon sampling theorem? Fundamental difference. It depends on the content, which is good as well as bad, right? So it is uh, for a smaller class of signals one can say so that's good. But Shannon sampling theorem told us what? Yeah, so that's good for this. Okay, but something in favor of Shannon. Guarantee to work is in favor of Shannon or it, well it is always guaranteed to work okay for band limited whereas here there is a probability okay, overwhelming probability but yeah okay I still agree with that. What else very in fact more fundamental than that what that Shannon sampling theorem guarantee you is the reconstruction of what of an analog signal. Right, very, very fundamental. It's an analog signal, right? This does not talking about analog signal. We are talking about discrete signal. Okay, there are continuous versions of compressed sensing, but we are not going to do those in this in this course. Okay, though they are called sampling. Okay, where with x instead of the s in sampling, replace it by x so sampling. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but we are not touching up, uh, upon that in this course. Okay. So, this is a very profound theorem. Uh, just the statement itself tells us so much, all right. And it is probably the longest theorem statement uh, that many of us would have seen, uh, you know, in this class. Right? Yeah. Okay. You are absolutely right. We have not talked about noise. And uh, so, uh, if you had noisy measurements, then this would need to be modified. Okay. So, we will do that as we move on. All right, so the original theorem as stated here did not deal with noise, but noise is part and parcel of our lives, okay. No matter what the measuring device, there is some amount of noise or the other, so we will talk about it. Theta has to be perfectly sparse in this particular um, theorem. If it is not perfectly sparse, this theorem does not say what is going to happen. That does not mean it is going, going to fail, okay. Theorem does not state anything about it. Now, 
let's look at an intuition for uh, you know this whole thing about coherence or incoherence so we are just going to look at it intuitively all right uh, rigorous theorems also are there we will state them later on intuitively all right uh, so for example you know this is an example of a very sparse vector all right and remember in compressed sensing we do not know which are the non zero elements of this this particular vector if you knew which are the non zero elements of this vector what would you do you know which are the non zero elements so you just delete the rows of the phi matrix which do not contain those all right and then what kind of a problem do you have to solve it becomes an over determined system because you know let's say it's a very sparse signal let's say it's a 100 dimensional signal with a sparsity 4 so then if i knew the support of the signal i need to take only four rows right and then i don't need to solve my basis pursuit problem what do i do then come on either pseudo inverse or inverse okay that's it correct so that that's good right uh, and then i will get the non zero coefficients and reconstruct the signal but we don't know the support so now, so this is uh, a vector which is sparse, let us say in the time domain, all right. Now suppose I took measurements of this particular signal randomly in the time domain. What does that mean? I take this sparse signal and I collect samples in the time domain at random. What do you think is going to happen to the sample value? The answer is really simple think about it this is my time domain signal i know it is sparse in the time domain and i am taking random time domain samples what are the sample values going to be most of the time zero because at random i will pick i have to be incredibly lucky to get a non zero value okay it is almost impossible that i get all the non zero values i mostly get zeros all right so if my so look at the intuition if my signal is sparse in the time domain my sampling should not be the time domain if my signal is sparse in the fourier domain my sampling should not be fourier domain sampling okay so instead we are saying that we want incoherent sampling all right that is we want the rows of the matrix phi to be quite unlike the columns of psi all right quite unlike is quantified by absolute value of the dot product so let's uh, let's go more rigorously so all right now consider that a signal is sparse in say dct basis any psi okay i'm just saying dct for example say as in this figure here so you know this could be dct all right or it could be time domain whatever so remember we do not know in, in advance which coefficients are non zero which are the measurements are given as y equal to phi psi theta this psi theta is summation over k psi k theta k right what is psi k here kth column of psi theta k is a vector or a scalar scalar okay all right now i am going to take the ith measurement in the vector y so y i is the ith measurement which is equal to the dot product between phi i which is the ith row of phi and the signal so it's going to be phi i summation over k uh, psi k theta k right is this clear now suppose our measurement functions that is the rows of phi were also sparse in the dct basis suppose what's going to happen then i am claiming taking such measurements carries no information about the original signal as most of these measurements will be zero to prove this rigorously let's go on so phi i if it were sparse in psi then what will happen phi i is summation over k psi k alpha k where alpha k are elements of the vector alpha which is sparse so now 
y i equal to phi i times psi theta. So, instead of psi theta I have this guy summation over k psi k theta k. Instead of phi i I have this linear combination. What is that combination? Summation over L psi L alpha L. Right? So, uh, this is a transpose, right? This is because this is a row vector, right? A psi k is a column vector. I have taken a transpose because it is a row vector. So, now what do we do? We open out these parentheses with simple algebra and I get summation over k L alpha L theta k psi L transpose psi k. What do you have to say about psi L transpose psi k? 0 if L is equal to k because psi is orthonormal matrix, right? So, if L is equal to k, psi L transpose psi k is what? Either plus 1 or minus 1, okay? I forgot in the minus sign here, does not matter really. Okay? It is plus 1 or minus 1, otherwise it is 0. So, this reduces to the summation over k alpha k theta k psi k transpose psi k which is summation over k alpha k theta k. Now see alphas are sparse, thetas are sparse. So most of your measurements are going to be summation over k alpha k theta k, they are going to be 0. Most of your measurements, right. So if those measurements are all 0, there is no information about the underlying signal. So, it is really missing data, right. So, this gives you an intuition, all right. It is not a rigorous proof, it is an intuition. Why do you care for incoherent sampling, all right. Questions or comments, yeah. Uh, the theorem that we proved earlier yeah. that just suggested that the number of elements in Y should be greater than some bound. Uh, so, even having Yi as 0 is a measurement, right. Even, yeah. Even though it's not, it's zero, but it's still a measurement. Yeah. So the theorem did not talk about the sparsity of y. Okay. Uh, see, if your uh, uh, if your mu value is very high, that means you know there is the incoherence is not present. The theorem, however, does say that you need a very large number of measurements. I mean, if mu square, if mu is root n, which is its maximum value, mu square is n. And so the theorem states that you need n log n measurements, right? You need n log n measurements. So it does say that you need a very large number of samples. So what do we want? We want the measurement functions to be non sparse linear combinations of the DCT basis vector. DCT is only for example sake, it is for psi, okay? So having measurements which are non sparse linear combinations of all DCT coefficients. Thereby, each measurement will have information about all the DCT coefficients, all right? That is what we want in effect, all right? So if there is a high degree of coherence, what will happen? One of your uh, phi rows, rows of phi, suppose it is exactly like a, a column of psi, that means phi i equal to psi j. That means it is a sparse linear combination of all your psi vectors, right? Correct? If psi i equal to psi j for some pair i j, okay. So, if phi i equal to psi j for some i comma j, what does that mean? This implies that phi i is summation over k equal to 1 to n psi k alpha k where alpha j is equal to 1 and alpha l l unequal to j is 0 right so the here is a here is a case okay. so this is an intuition all right in fact this intuition is stronger than pure incoherence this intuition is saying that not only should it not be exactly like one of those guys, it should not even be a sparse. So even a spar sparse meaning even two non-zero values is also not good, okay. So it is actually saying something stronger, all right, which is also another answer to your question, Rithik. 
Yeah. Pardon me? Why is it a problem? Uh, if that were the case, most of your measurements would be zero, which means you will have no information about the signal. Okay, zero valued measurements have, are of no use, really. Okay, that is why. So, that is an intuition. Now, we are going to move to our next uh, concept, okay, uh, which is today a lot more popular than incoherence, all right. It is called the restricted isometry property or RIP, all right. RIP has other meanings also, all right. And there are interesting jokes about this in the compressed sensing literature, okay. You find them on blogs, all right. All right, what is RIP saying, all right. So, uh, there are a lot of symbols on the slide, but uh, I will drop Greek and speak in English, all right. Uh, I say that a matrix A equal to phi psi, again phi is your sensing matrix, psi is your basis orthonormal basis. So, I will say that A obeys a restricted isometry property if it does the following, all right. For any S parse vector theta, A theta squared what is a theta squared? It is the squared magnitude of the vector a theta, right. How many elements are there in the vector a theta? m or n? m for mother, yeah, that is right, okay. So, the magnitude squared of a theta is sandwiched in between two quantities, right, sandwiched, greater than, less than. What are those quantities? 1 minus delta s theta squared, 1 plus delta s theta squared, okay. Pardon me? Yeah, it is the squared magnitude L2, L2 squared, right. So, for integer s equal to 1 through to n, the restricted isometry constant Ric delta s of a matrix A of size m by n is the smallest number such that A theta squared is sandwiched in between 1 minus delta s theta squared to 1 plus delta s theta squared for any s sparse vector theta. What is s sparse vector? At the most s non-zero elements, all right. So, in such a case, delta s is called the restricted isometry constant of order s. I missed that here, okay, I will add that in, of order s. So, we say matrix A obeys the RIP or RIP of order s if delta s is not too close to, to 1, rather it should be as close to 0 as possible, all right. So, let us try to make sense out of these equations, okay. I, I always like to think in English, okay. I love the English language, you know, I am an Anglophile in that sense, okay. I like to think in English, all right. If delta s is very tiny, let us say delta s is 10 raised to minus 4, very close to 0. What does this mean? A theta squared is lying between 0.9999 theta squared to 1.0001 theta squared. What does that mean? A theta squared is approximately equal to theta squared, right? Right? So, so what is going on here, okay? So, why am I talking about this notion of the restricted isometry property, given whatever has been discussed in this class so far. So, A theta squared is equal to theta squared approximately. What does that mean? Okay, this means the following. If A obeys RIP of order S, no S sparse signal can lie in the null space of A. Remember, right in the beginning, I had said that this is a very desirable property of A, right. We do not want any naturally occurring signal to lie in the null space of phi. Phi, of course, will have a non-trivial null space because it is a matrix with fewer rows than columns. So, 
that is a done deal. You cannot do anything about it. But we don't want sparse signals to lie in that space, right? Because when we are estimating natural signals, they are sparse in some domain, and we want unique solutions for that class of signals, right? So if a theta squared is equal to theta squared, right? Obviously, theta cannot lie in the null space of a. If that happened, a theta squared would be equal to what? If theta is in the null space of a, of a, a theta squared is 0, right? Which is definitely not approximately equal to theta squared for arbitrary theta, right? So, RIP implies that nice property that we wanted. So, Yash's question is, why should I care about this part? Can I then say, so if I did not have this bound, can I say that a theta squared is approximately equal to theta squared? It should not go close to 0. Uh, see, it is, okay, it does matter, okay. So it turns out, uh, and this will require, uh, is a great question by the way, okay. This will require, a, a really rigorous answer will require us to go into the proof. Okay. Uh, so if uh, see, so the delta s should be tiny, all right. If you ignore this bound or the right hand bound, your delta s would no longer be tiny, all right. And it has an effect on the worst case performance bound. You're going to see that your worst case performance bound directly is a monotonic function of this delta s value. So if you didn't have this bound, all right, uh, your delta s would be large and your worst case reconstruction error would be very large as well. Let's suppose, so let's uh, understand this in little bit more detail. Let's suppose we wanted to sense a signal s, uh, x that is s sparse in some orthonormal basis, all right. Now, the following is undesirable for a. What is the following? a theta 1 is equal to a theta 2 for theta 1 unequal to theta 2. So theta 1 and theta 2 are two different vectors which are unequal. This is undesirable. Why is this undesirable? Because if that were the case, then a theta 1 minus theta 2 whole squared would be equal to what? 0. Whereas we want it to be approximately equal to theta 1 minus theta 2 squared. If it is exactly 0, then unique solution is not guaranteed. Okay. All right. So, know that the difference between two s sparse vectors is 2 s sparse. So, if A obeys RIP of order 2 s, we have the following A theta 1 minus theta 2 squared uh, has its norm being, uh, I mean, uh, a theta 1 minus theta 2 squared is approximately equal to theta 1 minus theta 2 squared. And the approximation is given by 1 minus delta 2s to 1 plus delta 2s. And we want delta 2s to be much less than 1, right? All right. So A should approximately preserve the squared difference between any two s sparse vectors. All right. So all right, so RIP is intimately tied with our very, very intuitive desire that my signals are sparse and no sparse signal should lie in that danger zone, which is the null space of phi. Okay, now we are prepared to state theorem 2. But before I state that, so theorem 2 is much easier and more powerful than theorem 1. So I, I want to tell you one thing. When you do, when you compute the operation a theta, right, uh, a is m by n and theta is n by 1, so a theta is m by 1. So what have you done? m is much less than n. So you are reducing the dimensionality of the vector theta, right. Dimensionality reduction, this is one of the big buzzwords uh, in modern days, you know, in the era of machine learning, dimensionality reduction, right. So what kind of a dimensionality reduction is this? It's a dimensionality that is, uh, it's a dimensionality reduction which is preserving the 
magnitude of the original vector. All right. Right. And this has implication for efficient. Can you tell me an application of this in machine learning? Efficient pattern retrieval. All right. Your so instead of storing the entire patterns in a database, you could just store their signatures. The signature would be a theta, where a is appropriately chosen. Okay. So a should be chosen such that it is rip obeying. All right. And a theta squared is approximately equal to theta squared. All right. So it has implications for that. Right, so this is just a small little digression I was very tempted to make, yeah. Okay. So the question is, is this related to PCA? Uh, PCA is lossy. This is also slightly lossy because of the delta S. All right. However, PCA is not guaranteed in general to preserve the squared distance between different data points in general. It is not guaranteed. All right. It is not guaranteed. This is guaranteed to approximately preserve, but of sparse signals, not all signals, mind you, not all signals, sparse signals only. Uh, I am not familiar with that technique, T sign, right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know about it. But there are machine learning techniques such as locally uh, linear embedding, okay, which are guaranteed to do these kinds of things uh, to certain extent. But here we have a notion of sparsity. For sparse vectors, you are guaranteed to preserve the magnitude, all right. So it is little bit different, yeah. So what you could do is you could directly, if you have to do fast retrieval, you can just uh, you know, find out the particular signature whose squared magnitude most closely matches the magnitude of your pattern, right. So the operation is faster, right. You are operating on m dimensional vectors instead of n dimensional vectors. Right? So, all right. So Pranay's question is what is the use of a theta being approximately equal to theta squared, okay. But that is basically the question. See, if you are doing nearest neighbor search in higher dimensions, Right? You what do you do? You compute distances of the form theta 1 minus theta 2 whole squared. Right? So I am telling you that the signatures in the lower dimensional space are going to be such that a theta 1 minus a theta 2 squared is approximately equal to theta 1 minus theta 2 squared. So even after dimensionality, uh, dimensionality reduction, you are going to get uh, distances being preserved provided the patterns are sparse. So even after throwing out so much of dimensionality, so much of uh, so many dimensions, you are not losing out on distance preservation. So it is quite nice in that sense and it will be faster, all right. So we can, uh, I mean, okay, so we, we can talk in more detail about this offline, okay. This, this kind of a thing is a nice project topic, so all right. Now let us move on to statement of theorem 2 and then there is a theorem 3 which is exactly like this with some addition. Theorem 2, suppose the matrix A equal to phi psi of size m by n where the sensing matrix phi has size m by n, basis matrix psi has size, size n by n, okay. So A equal to phi psi has RIP property, okay, of order 2s where delta 2s is less than 0 0.41, that is root 2 minus 1 actually, all right. So suppose my phi was such that phi psi obeyed RIP with delta 2s less than 0 0.41. Let the solution of the following optimization problem be denoted theta star, all right. So where is theta coming from? The signal f equal to psi theta and so the measurement vector y equal to phi f equal to phi psi theta. So theta is the true theta, right, which is unknown to you. Theta star is the answer to this optimization problem. What is the problem? Minimize L1 norm of theta such that y equal to phi psi theta. 
then we have the following, all right. So, if theta star is the solution to this problem, then we have the following guarantee. Theta star minus theta L2 norm. What does this mean? It is the magnitude of the vector theta star minus theta. What do we want it to be ideally? We would like it to be 0, all right. It is not quite 0, but quite close, okay. So, theta star minus theta L2 norm is upper bounded by C0 over root S. C0 is a constant. I will tell you what it is into theta minus theta s L1 norm. What is theta s? Theta s is created by retaining the s largest magnitude elements of theta and setting the rest to 0. Alright. So, it is as if an oracle came down onto earth and the oracle knows what the true theta is, which you won't know. The oracle knows. And the oracle said, I am going to pick out the s largest elements and create my vector theta s. If theta is s sparse, what is theta minus theta s? 0. So, if it is a purely sparse vector, this theorem is guaranteeing me exact reconstruction. But, but we know natural images are not exactly sparse in DCT basis, all right. So, but they are compressible. What does that mean? If apart from some s large values, the rest are very close to 0. So, theta minus theta s will be what? Will be a small quantity, all right. So, if your signal is not sparse, but it is compressible, theta minus theta s L1 norm will be small and theta star minus theta L2 norm or magnitude is upper bounded by a quantity which is guaranteed to be tiny, right. This is wonderful news, right. So, you must download the slides, read them, okay. It is fine if certain points are unclear to you, they will become clear after another round of reading, right, because this material is not trivial, right. This material has a certain, you know, there is there is certain profoundness to it, okay, and one needs time to understand and digest the statements of these theorems, all right, because every theorem has a lot of symbols also, right. So, what is this saying? Theta star minus theta is upper bounded by a tiny quantity, which means even if I do not get exact reconstruction, I am getting reconstruction with high accuracy, with high accuracy. Because in practice, I am willing to tolerate small errors. JPEG does that. So should other technologies. Okay? They may not harm you. Yeah. Yeah. So I am coming to that. So the question is what about C0? How large is it? What is it after all? So I am coming to that. So before that, <coughs> so this theorem says that the reconstruction for S sparse signals is always exact if A satisfies the RIT with the appropriate delta 2 S, right. For signals that are not S sparse, the reconstruction error is almost as good as what would be provided to us by an oracle, all right, who knew the S largest coefficients of the signal S beforehand. Right. Would you know? You normally do not know the support of signal S. You do not know those coefficients. But some oracle knows it, okay. So, your answer is as good or almost as good as that of an oracle. Okay. That is awesome, right. Then, we know that most signals are never exactly sparse, but they are compressible. So, theta minus theta S L1 norm is tiny. All right. So, theorem 2 handles such compressible signals robustly. Theorem 1 said nothing about compressible signals. It was agnostic to compressible signals. It was talking only about sparse signals. So, in that sense, theorem 2 is more powerful. Okay. Yeah. Question. Mike to uh, Vashisht, right. All right. So, Vashisht's question is, what is the relationship between RIP and incoherence? Because theorem 1 spoke about incoherence, 
and theorem 2 speaks about RIP or RIC. See, RIP is more powerful than incoherence. That's point number one. But uh, computing RIC of a matrix is NP hard. All right. So there is a relationship. In fact, there is a there is a nice relationship between mu and this delta two s. All right. So I we will see that in lectures to come. But that's a good question to ask. Okay. So there is a relationship. So typically bounds expressed in terms of the uh, mu are looser as compared to these bounds. That is those upper bounds are very conservative. They would be uh, to caricature the situation, they would be like saying all of us are less than 100 years of age. Okay, You get what I mean, they are looser. This statement is true but it is loose. All of us are less than 40 years of age that, that comes much closer. Right, all of us are like, right. So, uh, so when you express bounds with mu, <laughs> with mu, uh, they are looser than with this. Okay, so the question is theorem 1 had L0 norm and somehow this is not saying anything about it. If you see, uh, you have to choose your S properly, okay, I mean when you are implementing this. When you choose S properly, it has a relationship with the number of measurements. I am going to come to that as well. Uh, as such, S could be anything. As such, S could be anything over here. All right. Uh, you could choose S to be N also. All right. But you will see later on that if you choose S equal to N, then you know this term just vanishes. And it is like saying I will always get 0 error. Right. If S is equal to N. The upshot is you will need many, many more samples. That is the upshot, okay. So, this point I will explain two slides down the line. Okay? I need to first say a few other things. Uh, just a minute, okay. Just let me finish. So, theorem 2 is more powerful than theorem 1, we saw. Now, constant C0 is independent of M and N, it is an increasing function of just delta 2s, okay. So, if delta 2s is large, C0 is going to be larger and larger and larger, all right. And that partially answers your question, Yash, about why do you need the upper bound as well, partially, okay. Now, yeah, ah, okay, that is great, all right. So, Dhruv's question is, this theorem seems to say nothing about the number of measurements and what is going on. Also there was a probability in theorem 1, 1 minus delta, where has that probability disappeared, all right. So uh, I will come to it, okay. So let us first state theorem 3 and then answer that question, okay. It, that qu question has two slides of an answer. So theorem 3 is, so theorem 2 is nice, okay, of course it is very nice. Uh, as an added bonus, theorem 2 is much easier to prove than theorem 1, okay. My possibly controversial opinion is that theorem 2 and theorem 3, the proofs can be done by uh, a reasonably patient high school student, okay, who is willing to sit at one place for 3 to 4 hours, okay, and has a certain amount of mental strength. But the math is quite simple. It is just Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, you know, basic dot product inequalities several common sense properties relating to sums and products and divisions and multiplication. Okay? So it does not require high fundu math okay, as such. So my opinion is that an undergrad student and in fact a high school student with a certain amount of patience and mental strength can do it. Okay? Uh, my opinion is theorem 1 is much harder to prove right? and theorem 2 is doable. And uh, you will see this because uh, you will have a fill in the blank proof of theorem 2 in your homework. Okay? But uh, I am going to be very nice and it will be a fill in the blank proof. So I will write the proof and you will fill in the gaps. Okay? So, okay. Now, 
we considered y equal to phi s. <laughs> what is y? What is y here? In a compressive system, what is y? Measurements. They are actually measurements made by a device. Okay. We were assuming that the measurements are exact. Okay. That is true in an ideal world, which does not exist. All right. In practice, you have noise, which is phi psi theta plus eta. All right. Under the same assumption as before, we can estimate theta by solving the following problem. All right. So we are going to assume that A again obeyed the RIP and all that. All right. Now we are going to solve the problem minimize the L1 norm of theta such that if you said y equal to phi s that would not be accurate okay because it is an infeasible problem right. The y you gathered does not obey y equal to phi s. So imposing that constraint in a software routine uh, is uh, terrible okay it is going to create it is recipe for disaster it is not going to work. Instead, you are going to have y minus phi psi theta squared less than or equal to epsilon. What do you think this epsilon is? It is going to be proportional to eta squared magnitude, which is basically statistically speaking the variance of the noise. Right? It is going to be related to the variance of the noise. All right. So, the good news is you know this kind of a problem is also efficiently solvable all right what's more there is code available to solve it okay so of course i will teach you how to solve these kind of problems or similar problems but there's also ready made solvers for people who don't want to implement stuff on their own okay so the ready made solvers are available via packages like l1 magic there's also the very famous cvx library okay which was written by Stephen Boyd at Stanford, where a whole lot of problems of this nature uh, can be solved. CVX is almost like an interpreted language written on top of MATLAB. And all you have to do is write a few commands and then uh, press a button and you get answers. Okay. So this kind of a, a problem has an efficient solution. Now, theorem 3. So theorem 3 is exactly the same as theorem 2 except that we are dealing with noisy measurements. Actually, you know, there is a tiny typo on the slide. This should be y equal to phi psi theta plus eta. All right. I, I missed that here. All right. So what theorem 3 is saying, the solution to this optimization problem is guaranteed to have this error. So do you see some deja vu? You have seen this, right? So what is new? Only C1 times epsilon, all right? So what is this theorem saying? This is almost as good as theorem 2, but there is one term extra, all right? What is that term? C1 epsilon. So if your noise is very high, you are going to incur a penalty. But if your noise is not too high, your penalty is minimal. You are not suffering very much. So I call this, uh, I term this as a very gentle form of degradation, okay. It is a very smooth, very steady degradation. It is not as if certain things they were perturbed and your great answers suddenly crumbled completely, okay. Your answers do not crumble, they just suffer a little bit, okay. Again C1 depends only on delta 2s, it is a strictly increasing function of delta 2s. All right. So this theorem and theorem 2 were proved by Candace in a tiny paper in 2008. Okay. It is a paper written in a French conference okay, called CRM. It is written in that. It is just a three page paper. The proof is just one page long. All right. So I realize I am slightly out of time, but I will still take two minutes. All right. So theorem 3 is a direct extension of theorem 2 for the case of noisy measurements. So what is it saying? The upper bound on the error is uh, consisting of two terms. One is the oracle term and the other is proportional to the noise variance. Okay, Actually noise magnitude but later on I will tell you that it is noise variance as well. Right? 
the constants C0 and C1 are very tiny, 5 and 6 for delta 2s being 0.25, alright. So, so people were asking. So, this is the kind of figures we have, alright. And they are increasing functions of delta 2s, just delta 2s, alright. Okay, so uh, the question about the number of measurements and the probability, uh, the answer is randomness, 